uh, multi-step problems, it's helpful to make sure we get the idea of applying the sig fig rules with each step, maybe keeping a few extra decimal places, maybe underlining. Um, so like I did this example earlier with the student where, like let's say you're doing 12.35 minus 10.257, um, you might sort of round that to 2.11 if you're just reporting that one result, but if you're going on to a second step, you might go ahead and keep 2.107 and kind of marking that zero is the last sig fig, so you're kind of saying, okay, there's three sig figs, so if we have to do a division step with four sig figs, we're still gonna round it to three. So you can keep extra decimal places around one, round once at the very end. Uh, you could round early, and then probably still arrive at the same answer that you're gonna see on the test. Like, that's really not a distinction that's so important for like an exam for us to test you over. It's slightly more important when you're doing like a lab step where you're doing like 10 sequential calculations that you're not rounding each time and then carrying on with that rounded number. So like we have a tiny bit of confidence that this seven is slightly more significant than rounding up. So that's why you might include it and keep it in future calculations, but still note the result goes to three sig figs. Okay, so we're gonna move away from um, these topics, get into chemical reactions. So we're gonna talk about the basics of chemical reactions today, balancing reactions, talk about coefficients for subscripts. We're gonna go through a few general types of reactions so we maybe have a small bit of ability to predict products of reactions. But we're just gonna look at a couple categories to get started here. And then we're gonna look at the mole, um, a fun unit, but it's really, I think, a very fundamental and easy to use unit. And we'll try to demonstrate that today, do a couple examples with it. And then a few reminders here. Um, the, uh, some of you have been asking, you might see this like, big list of homework assignments that are available that have due dates of like September 17th, that's the day before our first midterm. Those are all the dynamic study modules, those are all extra credit assignments, they're each worth two points each. You can earn back some points that you've lost. The maximum homework score remains as 100%, um, so you can use these as a practice, you can earn some points, buy yourself out of a homework set later, if you're going away um, for a weekend and you don't want to do a Monday homework set look at some of these extra dynamic study modules. Um, there's another bunch of them available before midterm two, likewise for midterm three. Um, so they're like topic quizzes. I think they're kind of, they're like very repetitive though. So I think for some of you guys, you may look at these as being kind of tedious and not necessarily something you wanna do, hence why I make them available, but only for um, extra credit, so you don't necessarily have to do them. Um, make sure to check your schedules for conflicts. The um, technical deadline for an early exam request was yesterday, but you can still make an exam request. There's some information on the exam attendance policy on the page on Carmen. That's where you submit your request. So make sure to get those requests in. If you happen to get ill, um, something comes up, an emergency comes up, there's also a, a slightly different makeup request when you're sort of requesting more of like if you want an emergency makeup. Um, but check out that information. You should be hearing back. If you already put your request in, you should be hearing back by this Wednesday. Um, from our staff about setting up your exam. Turns out it has nothing to do with me, so I don't have a whole lot of information specifically about how the process works, other than you should get an email, um, and then you should be uh, referred to or directed to the uh, exam testing center to schedule your makeup. Um, so we use the testing center for makeup, so you can schedule sort of whenever they're open, and then you'll get some specific instructions later um, if that comes up. So one other thing I meant to put a note on here today is calculators, so I'll write it. Remember, we need the TI-30 um, calculator specifically. Um, they're really, the TAs are really uh, st uh, strict here that you have to have a TI-30. It's either the X2S or the, uh, the TI-30XA. So it's one of the basic TI-30s that you can buy at like Walmart, Meyer, uh, Target, but it's not a TI-36, it's not a TI-84, it's not a Casio 509 or whatever they're called. Um, even if you have a simple scientific calculator that you know in your heart does the exact same thing as the TI-30, we do require that TI-30 uh, for exams. So there's two different models. This is the one that I like, the X2S, because it has that second answer button. So this is the one that's most similar to a graphing calculator. Uh, and if you are buying a new calculator and using it for the first time, make sure to do a practice test or two with it so you know where all the, the functions are. So with that, we're gonna get into chapter three. Uh, so with chapter three, we get our basics now finally talking about some chemistry. I think of chemistry as being a chemical reaction. Um, so we've done a chemical reaction before. That was where we took H2, it was in the gas state, plus O2, also in the gaseous state, reacting to form water. Now, presumably when we did, if you remember, we blew up that balloon that was filled up with the gases and we saw a big you know, kaboom take place. 
Um, water was being formed, like if you will, in a flame with a lot of heat. So that's going to vaporize the water as it's being formed, and it's going to go, uh, float off in the room as water vapor. Uh, perhaps you can en envision carrying a reaction out in a vessel that you contain, and then maybe then you can form water in a liquid state. So the states of the reactants do matter. We can specify what they are. You don't always have to predict what they are, but we indicate the physical states by either, of course, a gas, liquid, or a solid symbol. Um, and then likewise, another symbol we'll see more in chapter four is the AQ symbol for aqueous. You might see it pop up in this chapter. Um, we don't use it a whole lot in too many examples, but the AQ unit just means the substance is dissolved in water. Um, so that's the, the, the basis of reactions in water is the topic of chapter four. So we'll be talking about those um, events in chapter four. The thing today I think that's more useful is kind of thinking here that our reaction is telling us we need two H2 molecules to react with one O2 molecule. And if that happens, we produce two molecules of water. Um, so we have a conservation of the elements on both sides of the reaction. So we get sort of the net change before versus after the reaction takes place. So we can picture this, two molecules of hydrogen somehow react with oxygen. We're not talking how they react or necessarily even if they will react. We're writing reactions in chapter three. We're just trying to balance the elements on the left side and the right side so we have, if you will, a legal balanced reaction. So we have our before, um, H2 and O2, and then after, we're just simply making water. Now in terms of the lines, the Lewis structures, we're gonna pick up that in chapter eight. So if you're not sure how to sketch a Lewis structure of all the things you see in chapter three, that's fine. Um, we're just trying to demonstrate here that you're changing the bonding nature of the H and the O atoms from being bonded with each other to, uh, so the O is being bonded to O, the H is being bonded to H, and then they're being bonded um, with each other then once we make the reaction. So we make OH bonds and water as a result of the reaction. So of course, we still end up with two oxygens and four hydrogens on the reactant, or excuse me, on the product side, on the after side. Now the one thing that gets a little confusing if you haven't seen chemistry in a while is just remembering, of course, that the two in H2 is referring to two hydrogens and one molecule of hydrogen, and then the two as a coefficient is referring to the two molecules that we need to react together. That they are still two distinct molecules of hydrogen, one distinct molecule of oxygen, producing two distinct molecules of water. Um, the other thing that we might um, want to uh, um, picture is that, and start thinking about as we get through this chapter, is that we're not compelled as chemists or scientists to mix together a ratio of 2H to 1O um, in terms of the molecule count ratios. Like we can mix together whatever concoction of hydrogen and oxygen we wish. You can imagine a case, imagine we fill up a container with a ton of H2 and a tiny little bit of O2. If we do that, we're just gonna make a little tiny bit of water and just have a lot of hydrogen left over at the end of the reaction. Um, likewise, we can have a balloon maybe filled with a ton of oxygen, tiny little bit of hydrogen. We would put a flame to that and make a small little popping sound. We'd make a tiny little bit of water. And so you can imagine that the reactions uh, that actually takes place for every 2H2 that react, they need 1O2 to react with it. And it's possible for us to have an excess reactant left over uh, following a reaction. So imagine the simplest scenario where maybe you have three molecules of H2, one molecule of O2. We're still gonna end up making two molecules of water and just be left behind with one H2. So imagine we do a case where you just have like an extra H2 molecule around. Um, you run that reaction, then at the end of it, you have an H2 left over. Now, what we're gonna try to do as we get through the chapter is think about the math sort of separate from the reaction. Like, I'm not gonna go change my coefficient to a three on H2 because I've added three H2 for every one O2. I'm gonna keep these coefficients as they're simple, the simplest ratios to balance the reaction and kind of keep them locked in. And if I need to do math or think through a problem, I'm gonna do that on the side or I might sketch a picture. We might come up with some different ways of keeping track of our arithmetic. We might use something called a BCA chart, a before change after chart. You don't necessarily have to solve these problems any one particular way, but it's just being thoughtful and mindful that the coefficients tell us um, how much of the reactants we need to react with each other, then how much product produce, is produced as a result. And then if we're mixing random concoctions, we need to think about that arithmetic on the side or think of the picture on the side and piece it together. Okay, so the, the three basic reactions that we introduce in chapter three are combination reactions, and the book gives a really simple example of metals and non-metals combining. So if you take a metal and a non-metal, what results is the simple ionic compound of the metal and the non-metal. 
And so as long as we choose a metal that you know the charge state of, then you can sort of actually write and balance these reactions and come up with you know, what the reaction looks like just by your, your understanding that, say, aluminum only forms a 3 plus, that the common ion of oxygen is going to be the 2 minus, and then they're going to mix together to form Al2O3. And so then we can balance that reaction accordingly. So we could do something like maybe a 3 in front of the O2 and then a 2 in front of the Al2O3. That puts my oxygen into balance, so I have six O's on both sides. And then I'm going to need four aluminums to put the aluminums into balance. So we can do a little bit of predicting products here of a combination reaction of metal plus non-metal. We can predict the product that forms. Uh, and then we can balance the reaction accordingly. Um, notice that the sodium reaction is making sodium plus chloride minus. And so to balance that one, we needed two sodiums and a Cl2 molecule to combine together to form the two NaCl. Um, solids. Now, most ionic compounds, you would predict them to be solids. We're not predicting too many physical states here, but if you're wondering about the way the states are working, we're just imagining that we're making that solid ionic compound. Now, one other type of reaction that's really characteristic is a decomposition reaction. A decomposition is kind of the opposite of uh, the combination. Combination just puts things together, makes a product, um, and then the decomposition takes something and like breaks it apart into multiple products. So the decomposition of carbonates kind of goes this way, where you can heat up calcium carbonate. The little delta symbol means we add some heat. So the delta symbol, you might see this a lot in reactions. That means that we add heat, heat the reaction up. Sometimes it means add a flame. Um, but this one means just like basically sort of cook up the calcium carbonate, add some heat to it, and it releases CO2, releases that as a gas, and then leaves behind CaO. Now, if you're looking at the formula, what we kind of drop is we lose CO2 off the formula, and we're left with that one O atom stuck behind with the calcium ion. So we make a Ca2 plus, O2 minus, lose a CO2 molecule. Now, what's really interesting with that particular reaction is that this reaction here, the calcium carbonate one, is actually involved in the uh, formation of cement. So cement, you would take calcium carbonate that you would mine from like limestone, heat it up, um, and then it would release CO2 and then make the CAO, which you can then use perhaps as a cement or for some other purpose. Now, one reason I highlight that particular reaction is that the CO2 formation from this reaction accounts for about 5 to 10% of the global production of CO2. So as you start thinking of um, um, environmental issues and start thinking of CO2 in the environment, cars are what everybody thinks about as producing CO2, and of course they do. But we have to remember other types of reactions produce CO2 as well. So you start maybe, maybe going through a checklist of what reactions might we be able to replace with other types of reactions that maybe are more um, beneficial in terms of releasing less CO2, you might start thinking, OK, what are the most predominant sources of CO2 in the atmosphere? It turns out a, the use of cement turns out to be um, one that does put a fair amount of CO2 into the atmosphere. Now, there are ways that are being uh, studied to try to find like CO2 uh, recapturing methods on the formation of cement to not release that CO2 in the atmosphere. So you can sort of lose that as uh, 5 to 10 percent of the sort of man-made um, um, delivery of CO2 in the atmosphere and remove that portion. So I just bring up like a small current event that you can sort of tie into this topic. Now what we can also do is predict this for like the iron case because we're not changing any of the charge states on the metal or the non-metal. So if I look at Fe2CO3, 3, the carbonates, hopefully we remember, have a two minus charge. So we have a total six minus coming from the carbonates, which means I need a total six plus coming from the two irons. So that makes the charge on each of the irons what? The three plus. Because there's two of them, so each of them would have a charge of three plus. So that would be iron three carbonate. So we heat up iron three carbonate like we do calcium carbonate. What we're going to make is Fe2O3 solid as the ionic compound, then we're going to lose three CO2 molecules. So you can sort of see one base reaction and then apply that to other reactions. That if calcium carbonate can be heated up and lose a CO2 molecule, then iron carbonate can as well. It just happens to have three carbonate units per one unit of Fe2CO3-3, so it loses three CO2 molecules on its way to making iron oxide. Now, you can do a double check here. Three carbons on both sides, three carbons, two irons, two irons. And then we have nine oxygens, three plus six for nine oxygens. So you can always do that double check, count up the elements, make sure the reaction's still in balance. OK, then the last type of reaction, um, and this is the one that we tend to have as like a, a fairly easy to predict the products of this reaction are combustion reactions, where we're taking a hydrocarbon, 
Think of hydrocarbons as like CHO compounds, things like methane, ethane, propane, butane, et cetera. Um, think of the alcohols we learn how to name. That if we heat these up in the presence of oxygen, that what they do is they form CO2 and water um, as the products. And so, of course, this is another large source of CO2 into the atmosphere. But to balance this reaction, we would need two waters. Um, that gives us four H's on both sides. And then two oxygen molecules. That gives us four oxygen atoms on both sides of the reaction. OK, so and then likewise, we can balance this for really any other CHO compound. We're just going to balance out our CO2s. We need two CO2s to put the carbons in the balance. And then we'll need three H2Os to put the hydrogens into balance. So I have six H's on both sides. And then this is kind of um, makes us make sure we count this O in the molecule. So I have four oxygens here, three here, seven O's on, on the product side. So I'm going to need three O2s, give me six on the reactant side, plus the one in the molecule itself. So we'll be balanced with one ethanol plus three oxygens, forming two CO2s and three waters. We can throw the, phys uh, the states in if we wish uh, to show the physical states, yes? Are we going to use fractional Yeah, so the question is, can we use a fractional coefficient? Uh, like, depending on what type of problem you're solving, you could sometimes leave it as a fraction and then solve problems with that just fine. Um, if you're asked to formally balance a reaction as like a question, you would want to give whole number coefficients. Um, now, the, the whole number coefficients definitely make sense when we start thinking molecules. Like, if we're thinking, okay, I need one molecule of ethanol, three molecules of O2. If you're thinking molecules, it's hard to picture a fractional molecule. Once we start thinking moles, a fraction of a mole is much easier to work with unit. So we're going to start looking at the mole here. I think it's the next slide. But we're going to start thinking of how like 2H2 and an O2 react to form two waters. That we could say two moles of H2 react with one mole of O2 to form two moles of water. So you start thinking of the mole unit as being a huge collection of molecules. Then you can start to see how half a mole is a very reasonable unit to deal with. So generally, get rid of the fractions if they um, come up if you're formally balancing the reaction. OK, so formula weights and molecular weights kind of go hand in hand out of chapter uh, three. They're sort of, or excuse me, out of chapter two. We were talking about this a little bit in terms of using the average atomic weights in the periodic table. And so we can pick whatever molecule we wish. Let's pick like C2H2. Um, acetylene is that name. We don't need to memorize the name. Benzene has the same empirical relationship of one carbon to one hydrogen with a formula of C6H6. So I thought we might just kind of contrast and compare these two. Like we can obviously calculate the formula and molecular weights of these two compounds. Now, there's a small distinction. If I'm looking at something like, say, K2SO4. Now, K2SO4 is an ionic compound, right? It's not one of these molecular compounds. So that means it exists as the plus and the two minus, so two of the K plus ions um, interacting with the sulfate ion. The ionic compounds will describe this as having a formula weight, but not necessarily a molecular weight. Now, sometimes people will say, well, what's the molecular weight of K2SO4? And really, they're just saying, you know, K2SO4 truly doesn't form a molecule the way, say, acetylene does or benzene does. You know, acetylene forms the case where we have three carbons bonded together, another hydrogen. We're not forming these ions where we end up with, like, millions of ions all interacting with each other at the same time within, say, a solid sample. So in the case of C2H2, C6H6, we could describe them as either having a formula weight, which is just the weight of the number of carbons and hydrogens, or the synonymous term molecular weight for the weight of one molecule. Now, for K2SO4, an ionic compound, we'll say it only has a formula weight. Um, and it doesn't really form a molecule, so we don't really use the term molecular weight. So for these, the formula weight or the molecular weight for the uh, C2H2, this is really easy. It would just be 12.01 for carbon times 2. Um, and then plus 1.008 times 2 for the hydrogens for C2H2. So I get 26.04. Now I'm going to keep this as AMU because that's the mass of the elements in the periodic table that we're using, that these units here, we're thinking of these in AMU. So we get a mass for our molecule in units of the atomic mass unit scale, or AMUs. Now, the, um, the one thing that sometimes I get asked is, how many digits should we use on an atomic weight? Um, I usually use 12.01. I usually try to use like four sig figs. 
or at least two decimal places on the mass. So like H is relatively lighter, so I usually kick and use one extra decimal place. So what I'm trying to do, like an lecture example, is just maybe use one more decimal place in the units given in the problem. So like if you're doing a lab example and you've determined a mass on your balance in the laboratory to like five sig figs, then you might want to look up or use a couple more placeholders in your molar mass so you're not prematurely rounding um, using your molar mass. So it's like use the appropriate number given the problem you're trying to solve. For most lecture problems, four sig figs on the mass, and if you start getting into bigger elements, um, I like to go to two decimal places after the decimal for the, the larger elements. Um, for, so then for C6H6, it would just be you know 12.01 times 6, 1.008 times 6. We could have done CH together and then times 6 on the whole thing. So you could get this arithmetic done a few different ways. But I'll do 12.01 times 6 plus 1.008 times 6, 78.11. Oh, no, yeah, that's right, 71. 78.11 AMU. Now, the thing I wanted us to see for, I'm not, I'm not going to bother with K2SO4, because I just wanted to show one tiny little thing with the C2H2 example and the C6H6 example, and that has to do with their percent compositions from their formula. So if I wanted to calculate, say, the percent carbon in C2H2 or in C6H6, how would I do that? Well, the percent composition, we usually look at these as by mass. So we say, well, what's the composition of, say, acetylene by mass? Um, the percent carbon by mass would be the mass of the carbon atoms times two carbon atoms. Um, and so uh, then we'll divide by the formula weight, 26.04 AMU. So use the formula weight. This is the percent by mass of carbon in C2H2. So if we, if we ask you the question, well, what's the percent C in C2H2? You'd say, well, okay, well, there's two carbons, so that's 12.01 times two for the two carbon atoms, so that's the mass of just the carbons, and we divide by the entire formula weight. So the mass here is mostly carbon, so it's gonna be a pretty high percentage. We have to multiply by 100%, might be the last step we do if we want to get a percent out as opposed to a fraction, but I get 92.24%. Okay, so then one thought analogy would be, well, what do you think the percent carbon is in C6H6? Turns out it's going to be the exact same number, and we can show that. So if we said, now, what's the percent carbon in C6H6 in this other molecule? We could say, well, it's 12.01 AMU, but now times six, and then it's going to be divided by 78.11, the formula weight of the larger molecule times 100% still. And we can just check the math and see that this works out. 12.01 times 6 divided by 78.11 works out to 92.25. So within a small, tiny experimental error, or just a small rounding error. So 92.25% of the mass in C2H2 or C6H6 is due to the carbon mass. Now, what this really is showing us is that if you look at the empirical formula, and really, I was mentioning this in chapter two, that really there's an issue in chapter three that we talk about empirical formula, that C6H6 and C2H2 share that same empirical formula. The empirical formula of CH has 92.25% carbon by mass. So if you just think of 12.01 divided by about 13.02, that that's going to be the same 92.25% carbon. So the percent by mass, like if we tell you the percent composition of a compound by mass, what you can use that information to do is solve for the empirical formula. Uh, but then we also mentioned for molecules that that's usually not all that meaningful, that for like a molecular compound, just knowing the empirical formula usually isn't what you want to know. Usually you, you want to know, is the molecular formula this or is it this? Is it C2H2 or is it C6H6 or is it something else? Because it turns out one of these compounds is a gas, one of them is a liquid at room temperature, so they're different compounds, different properties, different substances. So if you're dealing with molecules, usually you want to know the molecular formula. So we're, we're, what we're going to see is a two-step process where we can determine from percent composition. So where do we learn or determine formulas from? It turns out from doing experiments that give us things like the percent composition of the elements. And then from there, we do a second experiment to get maybe a molecular weight that we can use to determine a molecular formula.
Okay, so in one second, we're gonna look at a problem that, that goes through that, so, or maybe in two seconds. So we're gonna look at a couple slides first, introduce the unit of the mole, and then we're gonna come back to the problem of if we give you some percent composition data, can we determine a formula from that? And if so, which formula? The answer will be the empirical formula. And then once we have the empirical formula, can we get some ex additional data to be able to solve and determine that molecular formula? Okay, so let's take a side um, detour here real quick through the mole and try to make sure we wrap our minds around the mole. So do you guys remember this conversion from the last chapter, that the gram to AMU conversion was that there was an Avogadro's number. Now there's more digits, that's why I'm just writing the dot, dot, dot. I think it's 6.022.14197, but I, I don't know. So but there's some extra digits. If we want to look them up, we can do that. So a gram has a fundamental conversion to the AMU scale where one gram is exactly equal to a certain number of AMU. And that number we take as Avogadro's number. And so this number here, sometimes we symbolize that as an N sub A for Avogadro's number. And September 23rd, people have a mole day. I don't know. I don't know about that, but, um, or why they, they celebrate a weird number. But so September 23rd, they have a celebration for the mole unit, I guess. Um, but anyways, it's coming up. I'm not going to celebrate it. Um, the, uh, so then, so the mole is defined in almost the same way. So if we say one mole, I'm going to say one mole of X, because like, if I define the mole without an X here, it's a little confusing. One mole of X is equal to that same number, 6.022 times 10 to the 23 particles of X. It's so like whatever X is, a mole of it would be an Avogadro's number of that thing. So let, let's imagine X is nickels. So if you have a mole of nickels, that would be equal to 6.022 times 10 to the 23 nickels. It's a lot of nickels. It turns out that that's several orders of magnitude more currency than even exists in all of the Earth. So if you take everybody's money and pull it together, convert it all to nickels, you're not going to have an Avogadro's number of nickels. Um, also, it turns out that if you take an Avogadro's number of nickels and lay them side to side, so you just take one nickel, one nickel, one nickel, and you do this around the equator, you go around the equator like 300 trillion times. So it's a big number. Okay. Um, I think you could realize it's a big number. Um, so, so a mole of nickels isn't a practical quantity of nickels you would ever contain. But if you say had a mole of helium, helium's a gas at room temperature. Uh, it exists as a monoatomic gas. So a mole of helium just contains 6.022 times 10 to the 23 helium atoms. So what about a mole of water? A mole of water would contain 6.022 times 10 to the 23 water molecules. So water exists as a molecule. If you have a, a, a mole of that molecule, then you have 6.022 times 10 to the 23 molecules of that compound. Let's do one more. If you have a mole of, say, K2SO4, then you would have 6.022 times 10 to the 23 units of K2SO4 or formulas of K2SO4. So if you had a mole of potassium sulfate, you'd have a mole of that K2SO4 unit. I'm just kind of pointing out that it's hard to, you almost want to call it a molecule, it's just not a molecule. But it's just the unit of two potassiums together with the sulfate ion. You have 6.022 times 10 to 23 of those units. Okay, now the practicality here is simple. Like the, the choice of the gram to AMU conversion being the same number as the mole to particle conversion is really helpful when we think of things like molar mass. Molar mass is exactly what it means. It's the grams per mole of a substance. So it's the mass per one mole of a substance has grams, uh, units, grams per mole. So if I say, let's choose water. If I say, what's the molar mass of water, the grams per mole of water? And so you can say, OK, number of grams, oh, really close to silly controls, hold on. So if I say the number of grams per mole of water 
what I would do is say, okay, I know it's 18.02 AMU per molecule. Okay, and we can even come back to how we know that in just a second. You know, just by taking the two H's and the O added together. So I'm just looking at the periodic table saying, okay, 16.00 plus two times 1.008 AMU. That's where I'm getting the 18.02 AMU. So just using the periodic table. So I use the periodic table, I get the AMU per particle, and then all I need to do is do two conversions, the AMU to grams, there's 6.022 times 10 to the 23 AMU per one gram, and then 6.022 times 10 to the 23 molecules of water are present in one mole. So the molecule cancels, the AMU cancels, the gram cancels, as well, Avogadro's number cancels. It's very intentional that they cancel. Um, and they cancel so that we know then that there's 18.02 grams for every one mole of water. So we can say, like the molecular weight of one molecule of water is 18.02 AMU, or we could say the molar mass is 18.02 grams per one mole. So one molecule of water, very small, very light, one mole, much bigger, because we have 6.022 times 10 to the 23 molecules now in the mass, but the numerical values are the same, just in two different scales. So 18.02 AMU per one single molecule, and then 18.02 grams per mole. Okay, so we can do problems where we go from grams to moles, moles to particles, <coughs> particles to atom counts. So a couple of questions you might think are, I see a lot of pointing. Um, that we could give you a certain quantity sample. We could say, okay, you have two grams of water. How many moles are there? So you could say, okay, how many moles are there? So if I take 2.0 grams of water, 18.02 grams per mole, then I could stop calculate the number of moles of water. This would be about one-ninth of a mole of water. And then we could say, well, how many particles are there? In this case, the particle is the molecule of water. So we can say one mole of water contains 6.022 times 10 to the 23 molecules of water. So then we'd have the molecule count if we stop and calculate here. So we could say, well, how many molecules are there in that 2.0 gram sample? And then the last thing we might do is say, well, how many H atoms are there? Or how many O atoms are there? How many total atoms are there? Because one molecule of water contains, say, two H atoms. So it depends on what you're asked. So maybe, you, maybe this problem would begin with how many H atoms are there? So if we're asked how many H atoms are there in two grams of water, all we do is that gram to mole conversion, that mole to particle conversion using Avogadro's number. We look at the formula to get the atom count, that there's two H's and one particle and one molecule of water. Okay, so there's a lot of use of the word particle and molecules. A particle is just a particle, it's just a thing. You know, a particle can be an atom, a particle could be a molecule, a particle could be like some unit of an ionic compound. Um, another th thought of a particle is it could be like a nickel, it could be like whatever, that, whatever the particle is that we're dealing with. We have an Avogadro's number of that particle and a mole of that substance. Okay, well let's there's some pointing, like so maybe just having you guys do a problem is that first one. So how many total atoms are there present in 25 grams of water? Let's give this problem a try. <laughs> 
All right, one more minute. Take a look at the difference between A and B here and how we can arrive at the right answer. So what we want to start off with is what we're looking for, number of atoms, because we're asked for the total number of atoms in 25 grams of water. If I said you had a mole of water, so you know you have one mole of water, how many moles of total atoms would there be within that sample? Like one or three? If you have like one mole of water, how many moles of atoms is it contained? It'd be three moles of atoms within that sample. And so when you start thinking of Avogadro's number, you would say, well, one mole of water would be 6.022 times 10 to the 23 molecules of water. You would have three times that many in molecules in terms of your atoms. So we need to go to moles here. We use the molar mass, grams per mole. So I use the molar mass of water. And I divide by it so the grams cancel, so 25 grams divided by 18.02. If I stop and calculate, that would tell me how many moles of water in this sample. It's a little bit more than one mole. Then we could say one mole of water contains an Avogadro's number of molecules of water. So 6.022 times 10 to the 23 water molecules are contained within one mole of water. So now I've converted to the molecules of water. If I stop and calculate, this would be the total number of molecules of water within 25 grams of water. And then the last thing I might do is to say, well, one molecule of water contains the two H's plus the O, contains three atoms. So I think, is B arrived at by multiplying by 3 twice? So if you multiply by 3 a second time, is that what leads? Or forgetting the 3? So yeah. So that leads us to answer A. OK. Questions? So this is probably one of the lower scoring questions I've seen so far. So. OK, it's a new unit, but it's also um, don't make the unit more complicated than what it has to be. There's just a mole of x is just 6.022 times 10 to the 23, whatever that x happens to be. Okay, so one of the other types of problems we want to solve in this chapter is the determination of formula. So we could look at an experiment that determines percent by mass of a uh, compound and relate that to the empirical formula. So this is kind of like the C2H2, C6H6 that these share the empirical formula of CH. So when we look at the empirical formula and say that this is 92.25% carbon and then the remaining 7.75% is H by mass, that the most you can do is determine that simplest whole number ratio. And then what you'd really need is that molecular weight. Do some other experiment to determine the molecular weight of the sample, see if it's closer to 26.04 or 78.11 so you can identify whether or not there's two of the empirical units or six or some other count of that empirical unit within the formula. So the key here is some experiments furnish this data. From that, we can determine the empirical formula. And then from the empirical formula with a molecular weight determination, we can determine a molecular formula. Um, the molecular formulas are determined from molecular weights um, in the empirical formula. 
that this is making use of usually like a mass spectrometry experiment. We don't talk too much about the experiments that lead to these numbers, other than one case we'll get into on Wednesday called a combustion analysis experiment. But primarily, we're not going to talk too much about the experiments that lead to the percent composition by mass or the molecular weights. But a simple experiment like a mass spectrometry experiment that we were talking about in chapter two, where we were getting like the abundances and the masses of chlorine, one of those types of experiments are done to determine um, a molecular weight. And then from combustion analysis is another method we'll get into a discussion of on Wednesday on how we can use that to determine formula. OK, so let's begin with this problem here. I'm going to walk through part of this. And then once we get partway through, I'll throw it to, to you guys to finish up. So this problem here says, which formula is consistent with a compound found to be comprised of 36.6% chromium, 12.7% carbon, and oxygen as the remainder? OK, so if we know that these are the only three elements, if I do 36.6 plus 12.7%, that that together is 49.3%. So this is 49.3%. So do you see how oxygen has to be the remainder? So the percent O would be equal to 50.7%. Um, OK, so we're, right now I would have a ratio of the mass percents in the compound. OK, so what I would need to do if I'm trying to come up with a formula, a formula is the ratio of the atoms in the formula. Or it's the ratio of, if you think of moles, it's like a ratio of the moles of each of the elements to each other in the sample. And right now, I kind of have a ratio of perhaps the masses. So what I want to start with is a ratio of the masses, which I know to be true of the sample. OK, you might remember these problems um, where it said to assume a 100-gram sample. How many of you guys remember that weird, like, assume a 100-gram sample? Um, so you start with 36.6 grams of chromium, you start with 12.7 grams of carbon, and you start with the remainder here, 50.7 grams of oxygen. Now, I actually don't want us to assume anything other than what's true about the sample. So the only reason you assume a 100-gram sample is to make the math easier. Um, and you only want to make the math easy because you just want to be able to solve this and think through this as quickly as possible. You just want to start with the mass ratio that you know to be true for the sample. The simplest way to come up with that ratio is to say, well, if I know there's 36.6 grams of carbon, then there has to be 12.7 grams of carbon, then there has to be 50.7 grams of oxygen. You can very easily check that that would be 50.7% by mass O, 12.7% by mass carbon, and 36.6% by chromium. So some people wonder, do you have to start with a 100-gram sample? And the answer is no, to start with some ratios that you know to be true for the sample. And if we want a ratio of either the moles of the atoms in the compound or the atoms of the compounds in the sample, what might we do? Like, what conversion might we use to convert these quantities? Probably want to use their molar masses or their atomic weights. Molar mass would be more appropriate with the grams per mole. So what's the molar mass of chromium? We just go to the periodic table. So chromium is 51.996 grams per mole of chromium. Carbon, we've done that one a few times, 12.01 grams per mole of carbon. And then oxygen, 16.00 grams per mole of oxygen. Now let's come back to our CH example for a second. So if I say C1H1, there's one carbon for every one hydrogen. There's, um, there would also be one mole of carbon for every one H. You can think of this as atoms or molecules, right? You could say for every one carbon atom in the formula, there's one H atom. And for every one mole of carbon, there's one mole of H. So at this point here, you could kind of continue, go from moles to, to um, atoms, and then count atoms. But that kind of ends up being an unnecessary step. So we can actually stop here, calculate the moles, and then see the ratio of the moles within this particular sample. What we're really trying to get to is the simplest whole number ratio. So if we stop here and, and calculate, so we'll do 36.6 divided by 51.996. That gives me 0 0.7039 moles of chromium for carbon, 1.057. and 
moles of oxygen. Okay, so now notice that this doesn't necessarily get us necessarily direct on the answer. Like, I can't just say this is CrCO3. We can't just round these. What we want to try to figure out is the simplest whole number ratio. Um, because these moles just turn out to be the specific mole counts in whatever that 100 gram sample led us to. So if we wanted to get closer to whole number ratio, what might we do mathematically? It's probably spot one and divide that into the others. And probably the smaller one would be the one to, to, to do. So choose the smallest one and divide that into all three quantities. And what we want to remember is that this is like a ratio. We started with a mass ratio. We had 36.6 grams of chromium to 12.7 grams of carbon to 50.7 grams of oxygen. And now we know that that's the mole ratio, the specific mole ratio. We're just trying to come up with now some uh, simple whole numbers. Let's divide all those by the smallest. And then when we get those, it becomes a matter of, do we need to maybe double or triple or quadruple? You might imagine doing this and you get like a half. Imagine you get two and a half for one of these. That's not a whole number. So if you divide by the smallest, you don't always get whole numbers. Sometimes you have to find a multiple to multiply them all by to get that simple whole number ratio. All right, so try to wrap this problem up. Try to find that, that simplest whole number ratio, the empirical formula for this compound. Well, and truly, it's actually looking for a formula consistent with this data. So um, the answer doesn't necessarily have to be an empirical formula. I think they actually all are empirical formulas. We're just trying to find a formula consistent with this data. So we're trying to find a formula that's consistent with whatever empirical formula we can work out from the data. All right, so let's check out here. So we do end up at Cr2C3O9. So the way you might wrap this problem up is once you divide by the smallest, you get one mole of chromium to one mole of carbon to 4.5 moles of oxygen. The key is remembering that this is a ratio. So if I multiply one of these by two and I don't multiply the others by two, then I throw all the ratios off. So if I change any of these, I have to change all of them to keep the ratios intact. And so what I start thinking is, do I need to double or triple or quadruple these coefficients 
and kind of just start with the smallest number and then keep going up. So it's going to be a whole number multiple at this point. So you'd be going by two, three, four, five, trying to find that whole number if we need to to turn these into whole numbers. And two works. So we get CR2, C309. And then we see that the choice we have to sort of put the carbonate ion together, three of them, two chromiums. Okay, so um, you can piece together formulas this way and then look for the formula that's consistent with this empirical formula. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so the. Yeah, so the question is, are we allowed to round these numbers here? You should only round when you're within you know, a small percentage of the whole number. So you should be within about plus or minus 0.05 units. Um, within an exam, it's, it's maybe a little easier because you, know, you have four choices. Uh, but we can't round more like a half unit off. Um, so usually it looks pretty obvious. It'll be like a third, you multiply by three. So one of them will be um, 0.33, you multiply by um, a factor of three. Just remember, multiply all of them by this coefficient. Um, this problem here, I'm not going to throw this one to you guys uh, today, but um, and, and maybe we can even quickly solve it, because this really isn't that hard, because what we would do is say that we have 84.4 grams of carbon, because the compound's comprised of this percent carbon, this percent mass by hydrogen, and we're given a molecular weight. See, the previous example was an ionic compound. We probably weren't interested and it doesn't really have a molecular weight. This problem here, we're given this compound has a molecular weight. So we're going to solve the problem the same way. So start with the grams of carbon, the grams of hydrogen, 15.6 grams of hydrogen, and just use their molar masses. And we'll get out our, um, the, the moles in this particular sample, so 84.4 divided by 12.01. So we get 7.027, 7, and then for the H, 15.6 divided by 1.008 gives us 15.47, or 4.8 if you round. And so here we got to do the same process, divide by the smallest, think ratios. Um, so why don't I kind of pick up from this problem when we start next time, and we'll try to wrap up. Um, how we find the molecular weight. So, the, so we'll wrap this problem up on Wednesday. All right, guys, have a great day.